Wow, hi guys, how are you all doing? This is probably the most amazing, beautiful uh, room I've ever had the, the pleasure to speak in. And you guys are probably one of the most attractive audiences I've ever had. So, can you all just wave your hands so I can take a photo? Just look like you're having fun. Wave your hands, whoop, holler. Look beautiful, look gorgeous. Ah, oh, perfect, my mum's gonna love that. So, imagine you're creating a brand new product like this Death Star, to solve a particularly annoying problem, like the rebel scum. You probably don't care what it looks like, you just want that device to be in existence so the problem will go away. We can see this lack of concern about design in many early products, like this early hairdryer, or this set of hair curlers, that's the, the scary device on the right or this device for curing Victorian ladies from hysteria, if you know anything about hysteria. Um, it's clear from these examples that the aesthetics and user experience weren't really considered when these uh, devices were conceived. It was largely an engineering problem. However, in a rush to the market, many of these products contained fairly critical flaws. Like, for instance, the hair curler's tendency to set their customers on fire. Not very good. However, even if that happens, there'll always be a few early adopters out there. Um, in fact, probably most of the people in this room, most of the startup uh, uh, founders and engineers, probably could be considered early adopters. You'd be the kind of people who are willing to use a product for the value it brings to you, despite the fact that it might look kind of difficult, might even be difficult to use. And if you're not careful, this can give startups a real impression that they've solved this problem when in fa and they've hit the jackpot, jackpot. When in fact, when less forgiving customers come along, they'll start to be frustrated by your products. Because they find your products ugly, they find your products confusing, and generally they find them just difficult to use. And if you're not careful, this could be game over from a, a burgeoning young startup. Because very soon, some other entrepreneur, even younger and even smarter than you, will come along and they will try and do a better job. In the early stages, they'll try and out-engineer you. They'll make a version of your product that's smaller. They'll make a version of your product that's faster. Or they'll add loads of extra exciting new features, like, um, the, the sort of the touch screen on the front of your refrigerator or freezer. Now, really, I don't want to live in a world that has, you know, SD card error messages on my freezer and I have to reboot every half an hour. But this is a kind of the, 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 the way that this kind of engineering thinking takes you. Interestingly, I think the only real logic behind the existence of internet fridges is the fact that flat panels and, uh, and, and Wi-Fi cards have got so cheap that compared to the cost of the fridge, it kind of just makes sense to throw them everywhere. If any of you guys were around in the 80s, it's kind of a little bit like this with little digital LT LCD s displays. You'd, f you'd find these little clocks on your cooker and on your, your washing machine and, and, and in all other kinds of devices. It was a classic case of the design being driven not by what the user wanted, but by the technical capabilities of the system. Now, it's fine to compete on technology for a while, However, engineering advances will slowly sort of stop being competitive. And very quickly, all these must-have little gadgets become a commodity. Now, this is the point where most uh, companies start focusing on design, when they've ended up finding that they're in a commodity market with a commodity product. And so you'll find the designs of these various products slowly evolving over time. In fact, what you're looking at here is about 100 to 150 years worth of design evolution of the products I showed you earlier. It's kind of interesting that eventually all of these products end up being gold-plated. I don't quite understand why. That seems to be the, the piece de resistance in kind of product designers. Let's whack gold plate on it. The thing that I find interesting is, like I say, while you're looking at this, 150 years of product design, you guys have got to pull off the same thing 
in probably four or five years tops. That's a huge amount of design innovation to pack into a really, really short time frame. Interestingly, if any of you guys are familiar with this device, as well as it being gold-plated, it has a USB drive. I don't quite know what that could be used for, but um, if you don't know what this product is, I won't tell you, but you can look it up on the internet later. So most people think the design is purely about aesthetics. It's what the product looks like. It's the shape and the form it takes on. And aesthetics are really important. They're a hugely important part of design. After all, you can use beauty to drive um, desire. Um, and you can try and outdo your competition because of it. For instance, think of a really heavily commoditized market, like the headphones market, where it's really difficult to out-engineer the competition. Along comes somebody like Dre, Beats by Dre. And actually, if you talk to audiophiles, they would say that the Beats headphones have got pretty inferior quality. They're all, they're all kind of top notes and, 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 and bass and no mid-tones. But what these guys have done is they've created a brand, an incredibly strong brand, and one focused on quality design. Now, it amazes me how few startups actually focus on building a brand, focus on the power that design can bring to their product. The problem is, aesthetics will only take you so far. If you guys are familiar with this stark juicer, Juicy Salif, it's a beautiful piece of design. You go into any design museum around the world and you see this, this item. The problem is, if you've ever tried actually making juice from it, it's terrible. It's almost impossible to use. Because good design is more than just what something looks like. Good design is how it behaves when it's used. Now, I think a lot of us in this room are super users. And when we're building products, we're building products for other people like ourselves, other super users. And we design products like this that are feature-packed, that have all of the gadgets and gizmos that I want to use if I want to pretend that I'm Jensen Button or some other sort of Formula One driver. And while this, this product might be great for other super users, most people who are using this product would feel intimidated by the level of complexity. So one of the benefits design can bring is its ability to simplify, to ditch that which is confusing or necessary, and focus in on the core of what you're building. This will help you expand into new markets. It will help you attract less experienced customers. The ones who just want a product that works and want it to work seamlessly. The best designers out there understand this. And they will work to develop a really deep understanding of their, their users, your customers, and understand how they use your product. And then design products around their needs. To do this, testing is essential. Because no matter how logical th things seem in the drawing board or in the boardroom, once you put things in the hands of users, they do really weird and unexpected things, things that designers and engineers never knew would happen. This is one of the foundations of what we call user experience design, or sorry, user-centered design. Now, if you're still not sure what good design looks like, um, one of my design heroes, Dieter Rams from Braun, created a list of 10 principles that drove his, you know, his design interactions. And I think they're all really, really interesting. And if you talk to lots of designers, these are the kind of things that really matter to them. Yes, aesthetics are important, but there's so much more out there. There's so much more opportunity. For me, good design is a little bit like a good detective story. It's a case of pulling together all the various clues, getting all the evidence in one space, sifting through it to find patterns, to find connections, to find out eventually who is the right culprit. Sadly, a lot of designers aren't like the sort of the, 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 these sort of really good um, detectives. They tend to just go for the first person that they think is the most obvious culprit and put them inside without really worrying about the clues. That's not good design. Now, I think this is interesting because actually, if I go and see any good design agency, this is what I see. I see good designers with stuff on walls, posted up all over the place. It looks like there's been a murder. And these designers are trying to figure out what's happened and what's going on and who the correct design culprit is. 
And if you guys are working with designers and their spaces do not look like this, I'd begin to worry because they're not doing it properly. Um, as designers, we've developed loads of tools throughout the years to help us guide our design decisions. One of my favorites, the one that I come back to on a very regular basis, is, is called the Carnot model. And I think it solves a particular problem that a lot of startups face. When we think of features, when we think of designs, there's an often a tendency to think that all designs and all features are created equal. However, it turns out that your users do not think like this. If you look at this model, basically you've got cost going from low to high on the horizontal axis and satisfaction going on the vertical axis. And there are certain things that no matter how much you spend, you're not going to make your, your, your customer satisfied. It's like when I check into a hotel, I expect there to be a bed, I expect there to be a toilet, I expect there to be cupboards. If none of these exist, I'm going to be really, really annoyed. But when I walk into a hotel room and I see there's a bed, I don't go, well, hey, I'm super happy. You just take these things for granted. Then there are a bunch of features that the more you spend, the more delight you build in your customers. So for instance, I kind of expect there to be a decent flat panel screen in my, my um, hotel room. If I go in there and there's a bigger one, and it's got a DVD player, and it's got you know, HD, I'm happier. And so a lot of hotels will just spend more and more and more on these kind of linear features, and you kind of soak them in. However, the thing that designers have known for a long time is there's actually a much cheaper way of creating delight. And it's this top curve here, the excitement generators. That's the chocolate on the pillow when you get back from a hard day and, and, and get to your hotel room. It costs almost nothing, but it gives you this lovely sense of delight. Um, adding stuff to the product like this is, is really easy. It's super easy. But these are the kind of little neat touches that get left out when you're writing your user stories or when you're looking at your Kanban board in favor of more speed, more technology. So you need designers to worry about the little details, to worry about the delighters that make your customers fall in love with you. I think a great company that does this is MailChimp. If you guys have ever looked at MailChimp, they're just full of delight. It's basically an email marketing system. But users love logging in and playing with this company because they're full of little jokes and little games. I think it's really powerful. Zappos is another company. You look at the Excels on Delight, their website isn't that fantastic. But actually, if you look at their customer service, they make their clients so happy. Another one of my design heroes is, is Seth Godin. And Seth talks a lot about this idea of the fact that your product should be your marketing. Rather than spending millions and millions of dollars on, excuse me, but PR or other services, you should invest that money into building the best product you can. Because if you build an amazing product, your customers will tell their customers and tell their customers. This is exactly what Dropbox did. Dropbox started doing the usual pay-per-click marketing. It was costing them between $233 and $388 per acquisition for a $99 product. Really doesn't tell you very, you don't need to be a genius to tell you that that's, that's not sustainable. So what do they do? They invested all their time and energy in creating a seamless experience. In fact, their, their founder said, we spent almost all of our effort on making an elegant, simple product that just worked and made users happy. That's a design, or at least that's an aspect of design. After all, I think all of us in this room, what we're ultimately trying to do is trying to create products and companies that our users love. And unless you're developing something for a technical market, something like GitHub, which is frankly awesome, by the way, um, but unless you're doing that, you need to have designers at the center of your process, at the heart of your process. Because it's incredibly difficult to make something that other people love if it's not had that love itself, that care and attention. I think when you see it done right, products like Nest, they're amazing. They have that visual surface, surface aesthetic that is just a beautiful, desirable product that you want to go out and buy. But also, it's incredibly easy to use. The designers have looked at all of the problems that their users have had with setting thermostats and made a thermostat that is just incredibly intelligent. 
And this is, this is a thermostat. This is a boring product that a year ago, you, if you were having a boiler fitted, you wouldn't have cared about. You would have just let your engineer fit whatever ugly piece of plastic that he wanted to and paid him. Now people are going out of their way to buy this beautiful design icon. So design can be incredibly powerful. A lot of this comes down to this concept of the experience economy. Joseph Pine has written about this extensively, and it's something I talk about in a lot of my, my talks about user experience design. Consumers are moving away from this idea of just buying products and services. They want to buy memorable experiences. This is one of the reasons why we're seeing this rise of a form of design called user experience design that tries to step away a little bit from the aesthetics and focus on designing how the product actually feels and how the product works. So I actually think design can be an incredible business strategy, a way of creating something that's incredibly difficult to replicate. And it's difficult to replicate because design is inherently hard. You see lots of products that just try and copy other products in the marketplace, but you can always tell what the copy is and what the real one is. Nokia has struggled with this for a really long time. I think actually now they're starting to get back on, on route with their design. But for years and years, they really struggled to produce nice design. Which is interesting, because actually Nokia is full of great designers. It's full of great R&D researchers. You look at the stuff that they're thinking about five or six years ahead, and it's amazing. But they couldn't get it into any of their products, because the design culture wasn't there. It was driven by engineering. It was driven by, we need to push out a new product every six months. Get going, get going, get going. So how do you design good products? How do you compete on design more effectively? Well, first off, you need to have a good designer. However, it's really difficult for people, particularly that aren't a design-led company, to judge what a good designer is or isn't. And so the tendency in most startups is to go to Dribbble, to find whoever the top you know, designer is of the day, the two, three years into his career or her career, that makes things look beautiful and hire them and make them the head of your startup, the head of your design department. And what you do is you tell them exactly what you want them to design and hope that they will go away and design it for you. If you do this, you won't end up with a designer. You'll end up with a stylist. You'll end up with somebody that's really good at following and mimicking the current trends, but lacks the initiative or experience to solve the really complex, meaty problems. They'll spend their time trying to make you happy, the founder, rather than trying to make your users and customers happy. Incidentally, if you don't know this guy, he, um, he is the host of a show called Hair Battle Challenge, where they get hair designers to come in and make things like the Eiffel Tower out of hair. It's a batshit insane program, I tell you. So sadly, lots of startups will hire a junior designer right out of the bat with the idea that they're going to bring somebody more senior on later when the product's a success. Now, these juniors may be able to pump out design really, really quickly, but they don't have the deep skills to really understand and build a good product. Because design actually takes a bit of a time. And when you're running out of runway, you don't have that time. I've seen far too many companies. I do a lot of uh, consultancy with startups. I'm a mentor at Seedcamp. And I've seen lots and lots of startups who, 18 months down the, line, down the line, are still struggling with design problems. Design problems that, if they'd hire a senior person, could have been solved in six months. They thought they were being clever by hiring a cheaper designer, but that cheaper designer was taking far too long to do the work. So one of my tips to you guys, basically, is hire the best designers you can afford at the start. It makes much more sense to hire a good designer now, and then slowly, over time, when the, the really tricky problems have been solved, bringing juniors later. Actually, most good designers don't want to be doing little kind of stylistic things. They want to be tackling the tricky problems. And they'll be more than happy to kind of get them to wean you off them um, you know, later on in the process. So instead of stylists, what do you need? You need design thinkers. You need people that can challenge your assumptions, that can untangle messy design problems, that can get to the right solution as quickly as possible rather than going around the houses. These kind of designers can be a huge value to your startup. 
Not least because they can stop you from wasting valuable time getting to the, the right solution. However, frankly, this level of skill and experience is really difficult to find, which is why there's a really interesting trend at the moment. I'm seeing lots of startups now start with a design co-founder. And I think, you know, in the same way that a really, really good technical founder can, can add value to your startup, I think a good design co-founder can do as well. In fact, two of my friends, companies in San Francisco, design companies, have recently been bought for undisclosed amounts of money by both Facebook and by Twitter. And they've done that purely for talent acquisition, because the big companies are realizing the power of design. And they're also really realizing how few good designers there are out there. One of the reasons you might want to have a co-founder, or at least a very senior designer in uh, your project at the start, is because actually the most tricky, important design problems happen before you've even opened up Photoshop or even opened up your prototyping tool. Because design effectively and essentially is a manifestation of your business model. And if your business model doesn't work and if your business model is broken, every subsequent design decision is going to be tainted. And there are good designers out there, good user experience designers, who have got a huge amount of experience of working with companies and, and, and startups like yourself to try and help design the business and design the business model. I think that's why it's important to involve designers really, really early on. Because otherwise, you might end up just designing yourself and your business model into a bit of a, a dead end. Another reason is to build this, this sense of design culture within an organization. If you hire a senior designer, um, they'll be able to kind of create this sort of culture and this care of design in the same way as a good CTO will, will focus on the attention to detail with the, the technology. That being said, don't fall into the trap that design is just one person's job. It might be a job role, but it's a responsibility of all of your team to care about the design. So you need to integrate design throughout the whole of your team and the whole of your process. The designer needs to be the leader of the design process, but doesn't necessarily need to be the only person that does design. I want your developers, I want your front-end coders, I want your Q&A people also caring about what the, the product looks like, how it works, and how it feels. It's everybody's job. Now, as I said before, Silicon Valley is really sort of waking up to this, the power of, um, the power of having a design founder. We're seeing funds that are being investing purely in design-led companies. Um, and the talent search is hotting up. So having a good design team can actually really increase your attractiveness to investors, particularly if you know, they're investors that are looking for a talent acquisition. It can add real value. I think Lean Startup has been really interesting. I think it's um, really helped the value of design in our, in our startup industry. One of the reasons is because actually it's promoted this idea of, of customer development, this idea of getting out of the office and talking to your customers, which is something the UX industry, the design industry, have been really sort of championing for the last few years. We love getting out and talking to customers and understanding what their needs are. And actually, we're quite skilled at doing that and understanding the various techniques you need to use to get useful data that you can, um, you can apply in your startup. And we're seeing projects in San Francisco, like this project called Luxa, which is like a, a UX boot camp, a design boot camp, aimed at startups to teach them lean design. So you go in like once a week um, for an in, like a, a really in-depth kind of design session over the course of maybe six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks. And this team will help you design your project and validate your customers and, and all this kind of stuff. It's really, really fascinating. However, even though these projects exist, it doesn't mean that what you can do is you can take a bunch of developers, train them to be designers, and suddenly they'll be doing your design. Design is a skill. It's a trained skill. It's a learned skill. And finally, one of the things I want to push back on against you guys is, is a trend I'm seeing at the moment, a trend that says we don't need designers. We can basically design our product using analytics, using A-B testing. It's something very popular in Google, and actually one of my friends, Doug Bowman, that's now um, a, a head of design or creative director at Twitter, left Google because they were forcing him to like A-B test 56 shades of blue to see which of the right color was. It can be crazy. Um, I see designing based on analytics and A-B testing a little bit like navigating only by using your sat-nav. Now, the sat-nav is amazing. 
And I wouldn't really drive anywhere without a sat-nav. But if you just look at the sat-nav and don't have a really good driver paying attention, this kind of stuff happens. This was actually a lorry driver in the UK that followed his sat-nav down a one-way street and got stuck and couldn't get out. And you might find yourself as well, if you, if you follow the analytics blindly, getting stuck in what we designers call a local maxima. It's this idea that you can optimize your design, an existing design, to the point that you can't optimize it any further. But actually, there might be a much better design just hidden over the horizon that you haven't been able to see. And so I think analytics is great, but don't be blindly led by analytics. So that's kind of what I wanted to say to you guys. I had basically sort of three messages or three things for you guys to do. The first one is just realize design can add a huge amount of value to your business, to your startup, to your users, to your culture. I want you to build a culture of design in your organizations that rivals the culture of technology that you're building. And I want you to try and hire the best designers that you can as soon as you can because they will add a huge amount of value and they'll, they'll stop you wasting so much time down dead ends. And with that, I am done. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you can play. Questions? Um, just as, while you guys are asking questions, before I came here, I asked a load of my Twitter followers, who are mostly designers, what they thought startups needed to know about design. So, oh, if you could um, flick the slides back on again. If, you, if you're bored of my answering questions, have a look at what some of the other designers in the world think that is important for you guys to know. So, question. Over there. Keep it close. Yeah. I can hear you a little bit. Okay, so as a bootstrap startup, You're absolutely right. I mean, it is, you know, it is tricky. If all you can afford is to get a product built, then you can't afford good designers, which is why one of the things I'm suggesting is find a design co-founder. Find a designer that believes in your product as much as your developer and can work together as a team. Because you'll find that some of the best, most successful startups out there, startups like um, Kickstarter, you know, uh, startups like um, Square, we all had a, a design co-founder. And this is one of the reasons why you're seeing these products being mentioned, why they're getting traction, because they're really well designed. So you guys might, if you just decide just to have a technical co-founder, you can get the thing built, but can you get anyone to use it? Can you get any traction? So I say go out there and try and find a great designer who will share your passion and share your belief in the product, and together you can build a, 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 great, a great product. I've either scared you all off, or I've given you every piece of information that you want to know. So um, I'm happy to take. Oh, there's one gentleman at the back. OK, so basically, the question I wanted to ask is, um, we just got from there, so we have a little bit of a moment to design. But our startup is making very design sensitive, but our design is very careful. So we have to attract a designer to help us really design something we already have. Um, so, if you're, if you're creating a design competition where you're actually getting people to solve your design problems, designers don't really like that. That's considered spec work. That's considered getting designers to work for free. And most of the good designers will refuse to work for free because this is kind of what we get paid to do. So you'll tend, if you're running design competitions that are focused on designing a real problem, um, you might find that it actually puts a lot of the good designers off. But what we do do a lot when we're in a hiring process is actually set them design tasks. But the tasks tend to be completely unrelated to what we do, so they know that we're not trying to kind of just screw them out of, out of their hard work. Um, and you can tell a lot, not just by the, and I think this is a key thing when you're hiring, don't just look at the final output. 
Look at the process. Ask the designers to show you their workings, their thinkings, their missteps, any sketches they did, any influences they had. Because generally, if, if you have a designer and all they do is show you a Photoshop file and that's all they did, they're probably a stylist. If you have somebody that can show you these annotated sort of architectural drawings, that can show you where they got the inspiration from and can tell you exactly what problems they were trying to solve, it might not look beautiful, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to have a beauty contest. You want to have a contest that shows substance. And so focusing on those, those challenges, I think, is the best way. Does that help? Yeah. And I think if you want to go to places where there are good designers, I mean, go to design conferences, go to design jams. There are lots of great designers out there. They're just, you know, they tend to be the good ones, tend to be pretty busy because there aren't that many great ones around there. So you've got to tempt them in. In the same way as you've got to tempt in your great developers. Because frankly, in a startup, any bank, any big company, any existing design agency can probably afford to pay them more money than you can. But you've got something that is actually really interesting to designers. Same with developers, you've got a challenge. And if you can show them what that challenge is, if you can show them how exciting that challenge is, and it will test their design skills, then you'll be able to kind of like draw them in. Because most designers don't really care so much about the money. They care about flexing their art and their ability to solve great problems. However, if you don't let them solve those problems, it's, you're going to be stuck. Um, are we out of time? I'm afraid we're out of time, guys. But um, I'm Andy Budd on Twitter. If you want to tweet me, we can carry on this conversation. Or if you want to you know, buy me a drink at the bar later, um, I, I'm, I, I'm open to suggestions. So thank you. Give it up.